Sight and Sound magazine finally got around to releasing their famous list of the 100 greatest films of all time. A poll of critics worldwide that's been conducted every 10 years since 1952. This year, 1975's John Daleman took the top spot, rising from number 35 in the 2012 poll, knocking my favorite movie, Vertigo, to second place. In one stroke, Sight and Sound has rendered itself irrelevant to anyone who understands cinema and the general movie-going populace alike. Are these sour grapes? Frankly, even when Vertigo won back in 2012, I questioned whether it deserved it. Vertigo is my favorite movie because I have a personal relationship with it. It doesn't surprise me that quite a few people don't appreciate or understand the significance of Vertigo. Meanwhile, I've never shown Citizen Kane to anyone who didn't see what was great about it. Whether someone is a cinephile or only interested in popcorn flicks, it's clear as crystal from the way the 1941 film jumps through time and hits the ground running. Its pacing, performances, and compositions are still so compulsively watchable it can't be denied. Art is inherently subjective, but I feel like there are ways to strive for objectivity. You can measure a film's relative greatness by its influence on other artists in the industry, by the techniques that the film popularized, by the people who worked on the film who subsequently produced high re highly regarded work. On all three of these counts, Citizen Kane is the clear winner. Vertigo's influence is obvious, too, to anyone who's paid attention to romance in almost any suspense film made after it. But John Dielman, in the lists I've seen of directors who've acknowledged its influence, the only prominent name is Gus Van Sant. When I watch the film, I mainly see the films it was influenced by. The influence of Yasujiro Ozu is obvious. The unmoving camera and compositions using architecture and furniture to create layers of proscenia. There's even often the single red object, like the ones Ozu used to stand in for the seal, typically seen as a signature in traditional Japanese painting. The film's tone also owes something to Tarkovsky and Brisson and Melville. The essay by Laura Mulvey, included in the Sight and Sound poll results this year, predictably hails the film as radically feminist. Mulvey has her own personal relationship with the film, and in this age, in which academics esteem their own creative readings of a text above the intentions of the artist, John Dielman is a perfect choice. The nearly three-and-a-half-hour film mostly consists of watching a woman going about the mundane activities of her day. It's like a Rorschach test. As we watch her going about her mindless chores, cooking dinner, doing the dishes, polishing her son's shoes, we're given so little information that the mind, or the mind with the will to focus, compulsively starts to generate interpretations. The more active the mind, the more willing to impose an interpretation on the film the more rewarding the experience. If art is a mirror, this is one that shows critics to themselves in the most flattering light. It shows anyone looking to have a good time at the movies, the door, or for a great many, the inside of their eyelids. And of course, the arduous task of watching the film in itself places a barrier between the critical click and the rabble. I don't believe a film has to be accessible to be great. I'm sure many people could say a Tarkovsky or a Dreyer movie is just as boring, and Jean Dielman has its merits. Careful viewing of its title character reveals aspects of her personality that will be important for the salacious climax that finally shows up. The fact that the film spends an excessive amount of time establishing its clues make them seem more profound than they are. In reality, a control freak who starts making mistakes, who's also a Holocaust survivor, who has an experience like the one she has in bed at the end of the film, doesn't necessarily take the action she takes. To say that one inevitably follows the other could almost be called misogynistic, even misanthropic. As a portrait of an individual, though, rather than a symbol, the film is an interesting image of a zealous desire for conformity. 
Jean Dielman is not an every woman. Anyone who takes her as a symbol of the lives of women anywhere isn't paying attention. This is a woman who sleeps in a room with wood the same color as her hair, who wears clothes the same color as her spotless walls. Neither she nor anyone around her engage in small talk that ever comes off as believably human. It's like watching a film about living mannequins without Kim Cattrall. It's consciously stylized, again, clearly influenced by Ozu, but lacking Ozu's interest in human warmth. Mostly it feels like exactly what it is, a movie made by an inexperienced, somewhat interesting filmmaker who has yet to establish her own voice from the collective of her influences. As a film ranked anywhere in the 100 greatest movies of all time, it's obviously a political choice, but politics are clearly a heavy influence on the list, which also includes movies like Moonlight and Parasite, but lacks a single Tarantino film, a filmmaker whose name has become a byword for great filmmaking. It lacks a single Steven Spielberg film, a John Huston film, a Roman Polanski film. If influence truly were the metric, obviously Star Wars should be on the list. So now we can toss this on the pile that includes the Oscars and much of the academic establishment, an institutionalized parody of a time when people used to have real belief in the merits of art rather than zealous fixations on theory and politics. Jean Dielman is available on the Criterion channel.